the Japanese culture eats a lot of rice, a lot of carbohydrates, then why do the Okinawans live so long? What is going on here? Like, is, are we missing something? Because on this channel, we talk a lot about a lower carb approach. Do we need to completely erase a lot of the things that we've talked about? No, there is a pretty simple explanation that leads to a more in-depth, broad explanation. And we're gonna dive into it because I find it very, very interesting. And it's not just the Okinawans, it's a lot of the other blue zones too, but the Okinawans are the most pronounced with this one fundamental thing that I wanna talk about. Hey, after today's video, if you wanna save a bunch of money on your groceries, check out Thrive Market. There is a 25% off discount link to save literally 25% off your entire grocery order. So Thrive Market makes it so you can get better for you options delivered to your doorstep. It's literally an online grocery store, except it doesn't have garbage. It has stuff that's better for you. So like you can go there and you can navigate to paleo, you can navigate to vegan, plant-based, you can navigate to autoimmune, you can all kinds of stuff, keto, whatever. And then it sorts by that and you can subfilter and you can get all your groceries delivered to your doorstep. And using that link below, you'll save 25% off your entire first order. Plus, because you're watching this video, you'll get a free gift that you get to choose through Thrive Market as well. So check out that link down below after this video. You see, Okinawans are different from the rest of Japan. Shortly after World War II, when a lot of Japan became very industrialized and Tokyo and some of the bigger metropolitan areas really started getting more of the refined foods that we see like throughout the world today, they really went heavy into that. So a lot more refined stuff, a lot more starches, and definitely more rice. Whereas the Okinawans, although they still probably consume some rice, their diet is much more rich in the root vegetables and living off the farmland that's out there, right? So a high degree of purple potatoes, which are interesting, and a very high degree of sweet potatoes. But when you analyze their diet, there are two things that really stand out. Number one, diverse amount of fiber, okay? Which we'll talk about separately here in just a second. And the second thing is they eat in a 15% effortless caloric deficit. They're pretty much always in a deficit, which is very, very intriguing. Now, that doesn't mean they're in a deficit every single day. I'm sure they have days where they're in a surplus. But being in a deficit in general, whether it be through fasting, whether it be through just limiting your calories, or perhaps even increasing exercise to create a deficit, it has some interesting benefits as far as what is called FOXO, FOXO3. Now, FOXO allows for the proper gene expression to basically help DNA repair, but also help with what is called antioxidant production, endogenous antioxidant production. So this means that when we have an increase in FOXO3, we have an increase in superoxide dismutase, an increase in glutathione. These are free radical scavenging components within our body. So when our cells are manufacturing energy and they're creating a lot of, let's just call it exhaust for simple purposes, well, that exhaust can damage things, okay? It's rogue electrons. It's basically electrons that have escaped through the electron transport chain and they have um, basically through redux, they've been able to escape the cell and they float around through the body. Well, we need to neutralize those, okay? So we need to be able to neutralize by having positively or negatively charged, whatever the case may be, right? That's more complicated. The bottom line is that when we produce more of these antioxidants, we can neutralize that more. And that can potentially reduce DNA damage. It can potentially reduce other cellular damage, uh, damage to the endothelial cells, okay, that can constrict the arteries, all kinds of things that are important to pay attention to. But outside of that, the sweet potato consumption and the fiber consumption is very beneficial. Okay, so with sweet potatoes in particular, they are a resistant starch. So what that means is that these resistant starches resist breakdown, they resist digestion. So they stay in the intestines longer. And when they stay in the intestines longer, what that means is the bacteria within our gut have a longer time to feed on them. Our bacteria feed on fiber and they feed on starches that don't digest. The bacteria ultimately digest them. It's not really digestion, it's more like feeding and cross feeding. As a result, you have more butyrate. This is long-term downstream effect as a result of the bacteria feeding on fiber. 
there are specific bacteria that are called butyrate producers, and these butyrate producers then produce butyrate. Now, butyrate is a short chain fatty acid. There's butyrate, propionate, and acetate, and these butyrates specifically, they are interesting because they feed the epithelial cells. Okay, they nourish the cells within our gut, making our gut stronger and making our gut more powerful in that sense. But they also act as a signaling device that help us with glucose metabolism, help us with fatty acid metabolism, and a number of other things. Now, of course, having a diverse microbiome is also very important. So the more fiber and the more resistant starches, the more the bacteria can flourish and those communities can grow. And there was a study that was published in the journal Nature that said when it came down to like health span, it came down to overall longevity, it looks like diversity is the most important thing. Having a high abundance of a lot of different kinds of bacteria is one of the best things that you could have because we don't know the answers surrounding the individual strains just yet. So that is a very big piece. Another thing is they consume a fair bit of legumes and they consume quite a bit of things like uh, lentils, which is interesting because they're not grains. So it's not like the rices and the starches, they're legumes. And that is interesting because some people will say that there's a negative effect when it comes down to oxalates, when it comes down to phytic acid and those things. But you also have to look at it as an, a hormetic stressor. A small amount of these phytates or phytic acid that might be bad for the gut, a small amount might allow the gut to become more resilient and allows us to become stronger in dealing with them. It's sort of what's called the anti-fragile principle. We're not trying to eat ourselves into a corner where we're so like particular about what we eat that we can't handle eating things. We want to give ourselves little tastes of things here and there so that our body develops the ability to deal with it. So perhaps these anti-nutrients or these phytic acids that are in legumes in small amounts like they consume are good. And you know, moderate amounts of meat a few times per week. Now that's an interesting one because I am much more about prioritizing protein, at least from a body composition standpoint. So I can't comment too much on that because that's a divergence from my way of thinking. However, they still consume protein. They're getting adequate amounts. And I've seen plenty of people that are even plant-based or lower animal-based protein that still have good amounts of muscle and maintain lean mass. I think that comes down to a lifestyle component more than anything. The other interesting piece that I want to add in here is that they have relatively stable insulin levels as a result of their diet. Higher fiber levels, higher amounts of legumes, and again, talking about the lentils, things like that. So we don't have a big insulin spike all the time. This more moderate level of insulin can lead to more autophagy and more what's called mitophagy. Basically, the cells are able to go through their own survival of the fittest component and become stronger. If we have huge, these huge undulations and big spikes in insulin, that does stop the autophagy and mitophagy process or at least attenuates it. So being able to keep stable and lower insulin levels might be better when it comes down to these cellular rejuvenation processes. The last thing that I want to add in here that's really kind of interesting is the amount of seaweed they consume. There isn't a good abundance of seaweed that is consumed in the Okinawan diet. Now there was a study that was published in the journal Food Science that demonstrated that seaweed has components in it that can actually act as an ACE inhibitor. And you've probably heard of an ACE inhibitor before because there's drugs that are ACE inhibitors, right? So by being an ACE inhibitor, not only could this be potentially good for cardiovascular risk, but it also plays a role in the breakdown of glucagon-like peptide 1. It actually inhibits glucagon like peptide 1, GLP-1. So it inhibits the breakdown of it, excuse me. So if we inhibit the breakdown of GLP-1, that means that we have more stable circulating levels of GLP-1. What does GLP-1 do? GLP-1 will help protect and allow the pancreatic beta cells to still produce insulin. We run into a problem metabolically, metabolic dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction, when our pancreas isn't secreting insulin anymore insulin resistance, we have issues, right? It's a problem. So if we can help support those pancreatic beta cells by having stable levels of GLP-1 and we're inhibiting the breakdown, that could be a good thing. This is pretty nuancy and rather mechanistic, but the observational data tells us a lot, the epidemiological data. The Okinawans are doing something right. So let's apply some principles from them and apply those into our diet and lifestyle. Even though we're not living like the Okinawans, we can learn from them. As always, keep it locked in my channel. See you tomorrow.